We're going to continue in our journey in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We're going to study verses 18 through 27. And the message today is titled, Be Light. Be Light. You know, it's kind of interesting because this morning, you know, now with the time change, you know, the hour going forward, uh, it's not light in the morning as it was just, you know, just the other day. And so there's going to be some readjustment that we had to go through, right? Our minds and our bodies, because, you know, you know we all know we lost an hour. And, uh, but we'll eventually get back. I'll share with Pastor Hector that in eternity, it's all redeemed. So that's the great news, right? It's all redeemed, eternity. But there's some adjustments that we need to go through, some tweaking in our life with this time change. And the same could be said in regards to our walk with the Lord, it needs to be tweaked every day. If we're going to be light, there has to be tweaking in our life. This is what Jesus was pouring into the disciples. This is still the, the continuation of that discussion, that teaching that Jesus was giving to the disciples before his crucifixion. He knew That his hour was coming soon. The betrayal was just literally right around the corner. And so the time that he had left the disciples was all about urgency and pouring into them. So that eventually when the descending of the Holy Spirit would come upon the disciples on Pentecost. They would be revived and renewed in truth. So that they would go out into the world and be light. Be light. Just as we today are called to be light. So in that discourse, Jesus begins to now transition from what we discussed last week, which the message was titled, The Decision to Love the exhortation to love one another. So that way the world will know that Jesus is alive, that he lives in his disciples and his followers, that clearly he resurrected on that third day. So right when they're about to get to all excited regarding, well, you know what? Okay, we may be a difficult bunch you know, and the same could be said this morning, different personalities and different you know, characters, just even in a small fellowship. But, but collectively, in the body of believers, there's a plethora of differences as far as, you know, the modus operandi, so to speak, and, and the, the, the character and, and just the ins and outs of individuals. But yet, nonetheless, the command that Jesus has given us to love one another, we can embrace that and say, you know what? That is definitely something we should all be aiming for, to love one another, to lay down our selfish ways and pick up the needs of others. And so we're like, yeah, let's do that. We're in, right? We could could exhort one another in that, right? Amen, right? Can't we? We definitely could do that. But then Jesus then comes to the new subject. Because along with that love, and we talked about this last week, this is not the love that the world believes is love, the definition of the world, I mean the definition of love according to the world, but this is agape, pure love, God's love, true love. And and the love that is, is double, you know, comes with two sides, you know, just like a coin has two sides. Because love just doesn't say, hey, do whatever you want. No, nobody as a, as a parent tells their children, hey, I love you so much that I'm going to let you do whatever you want. You know, go out there and, and abuse yourself. Go out there and jump in front of a moving car. Go out there and, and get involved in things that ultimately are going to you know, bring harm to you. Yeah, I love you that much. No, you say, I love you enough to intervene in your life, especially when they're children, to intervene in your life lovingly to say no because that will bring harm to your life. And so there's that accountability aspect. There's, there's definitely the two sides of love. And so along with that, 
You know, just like with children, when we tell them no, and it's something that they desperately want to do, what happens? They rebel. They rebel. We too were once there. You know, as children, rebelling against our parents and copping an attitude, right? It's like, what do you mean I can't go to that party? You know? What do you mean I can't hang out with those friends? Those are my friends. What do you mean I can't do this? What do you mean I can't do that? Who are you to tell me? Well, I'm, I'm your, I'm your, we're your parents. We know what's best for you. And then the rebellion begins and the, and the hardening of the heart comes. And then eventually, in some cases, what creeps in? Hate. Hatred towards your own parents. You know? They're trying to keep me from, from you know, just becoming my own independent individual and discovering things on my own and all, you know, all, all these, all these uh, thoughts come floating through the head that, you know what, that's nothing new because what happens, they, we make it all about ourselves. It's all about me, 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 and I. I know best, you know. I always uh, share with our, our daughters one thing as they were starting to uh, grow older and it's something that we discover as, as kids, inevitably, with our parents. You know, if we have loving parents that truly care for us, we inevitably discover as we get older, and as they get older, that, you know, that they are extremely wise, right? The, the older that I get, the more I realize how wise my parents are. And so, you know, I share with our, our daughters that, you know what, I don't care what, what education you receive, what, what uh, diplomas you may receive or bachelor's or PhD or this or that, just by the mere fact, by the mere fact that I'm alive much longer than you have been, I will always know more than you. It's just called experience, right? It's experience. And some of the roads that you're beginning to travel down, I could tell you through experience, it's the wrong road. Just by experience. And so... In that, like I said, so you know, a parent will, will warn their, their, their child in regards to the dangers of making poor decisions and doing their best to train them and, and steer them in the right direction for prosperity and success. But then rebellion kicks in, and then the hate sinks in. And so that, that's what Jesus then brings into the reality of the disciples and to us this morning. You know, Jesus came from heaven with a message of salvation, with a message of love. And we know that ultimately the world rejected that message and they crucified him. He knows what's ahead, the difficulties of the faith. And so he gives this warning beginning here in verse 18 in John 15. He says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, here what we're really called to do because, you know, we could, we could get this false impression regarding that everything we do, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in the next couple of verses, that everything we do, that if we get any opposition, any attitude from others that maybe perhaps are non-believers, we immediately attribute it to, well, it's because I'm a Christian, you know? And be careful of that. Be careful of that. Because, you know, sometimes we get this, this, this thought that everything comes down to that. And, and then you start slipping into almost like a, a victim mentality. And we're not victims by any stretch of the imagination. We're not. Sometimes, sometimes we're victims of our own shortcomings and doings, right? You know, it's the old, we stick our foot in, the, in, in our mouth and, and we may say things or do things that, you know, then as a, instead of embracing responsibility, and asking for forgiveness, then we put up the shield of, well, you're just behaving that way because I'm a Christian. But really, what, what we're called to do is to contend for the faith, because that's what Jesus did. See, he came from heaven, and he contended for the faith, the purity of the faith. 
to the Jews, to the religious leaders. The message that he was giving to them throughout his ministry, those three years, was that, you know what, you are leading God's people astray with teachings that are not true. And you put on people religious demands that are impossible to keep, that you don't even keep yourself, and you live in hypocrisy. And God hates hypocrisy. He wants transparency. He made it very clear that no one, no one can live the commands of God. Who can, who can live the Ten Commandments each and every day? We all fall short of the glory of God. He brought the message of grace. He came to love the unlovable, to pursue you know, the lost, the downtrodden, the, the brokenhearted. He came as a physician to bring healing to those who are sick. And as we know, that's rhetorical because who here amongst us aren't sick? We're all sick in one way, shape, or form. It reminds me of this uh, woman who has, who's a single mother out in Hawaiian Gardens and who has a daughter, uh, her youngest daughter, her name is Roxy, 13 years old, and between her second to the last daughter and Roxy, there's, there's quite a bit of age gap. And, and, you know, um, I, can't, I, I, I think about the fact that, you know what, if I were to have a child at this age, <laughs> you know, what would that be like? And, and the first thought is exhausting, <laughs> right? You know, I definitely don't have the same energy now that I did back when I was, you know, with, with Alicia when she was first born. You know, 24 years old, 24 years old, man, come on, man, stay up all night, do this, do that, and no problem, you know? But to, to think at 49 and, and having a child now, it's just like, ooh, man, you know? And, and, but we know that it, you don't put forth or at times can't. And, and because of this woman's situation, you, you could clearly uh, just see or, or, or understand that her attention to the final child has not been as great as to the other ones. And so there's this rebellion going on and she ran away from home and, and ultimately I, I, I shared with her this like, you know what, if you're willing, if you're willing to receive help, there'll be people who come alongside you and love on your family and love on your daughter. And she said yes. And so I did a follow-up call and said, hey, how are things going? And she said, you know what, I have my daughter now in a new school and things are starting to turn around. And I said, great. And I spent a little time on the phone with Roxy encouraging her. And eventually, mom came back on the phone. And so I said, well, these are, these are the next steps. And so are you willing to take those next steps? Ultimately, it's, the bottom line is going to be connecting you to the God who loves you and created you and knows you better than anybody else can ever know you. you know? And she says, you know what? My daughter's important, but I have a question for you. you know? And I said, what is the question? She said, I have problems too. Can God help me? And I said, Absolutely. You know, and so it was so beautiful to see that that you know that openness and the understanding to be able to share that that's why Christ came, and so we're to contend for that faith. We're to contend for the faith, but knowing in advance that when we contend for the faith with a pure heart, in love, in God's love, there's going to be adverse reactions in some cases and especially from the world. And, and when, when Jesus says the world here, he's talking about the world system. The world system. And we know that within the world system, there's people, you know, and you and I were once there, are enemies of God, because the Bible clearly teaches that either you're for Christ or you're against Him. There's, there's, no, there's no in between. Either you're serving the Lord or you're serving Satan. There's, there's no in-between. And so in that, there's that spiritual warfare that's going on as far as systems. You see, because Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God. And that's why I said the kingdom of God is before us. You know? The kingdom of God is, is present. And the kingdom of God lives within the children of God. 
And so there's this kingdom living, and it comes and it presents itself to a world system that is anti-Christ, who just despises Christ himself. And so those that represent Christ, because of him, will be despised as well. And so this is almost like a warning to us as well that, you know what, if there's no, if there's no conflict as far as when it comes to your faith in your life, you might want to kind of ask yourself, am I in, in the faith and am I in the battle? Am I contending for the faith purely? Because we'll soon see that along with that comes the confrontation in regards to what keeps man from relationship with God and that sin. That's the barrier we're all born in sin, and, and, and Jesus came to die for our sin so they could restore that broken relationship. And so eventually, inevitably, when you begin to come to the, to the crux of things, so to speak, it's sin. Turn with me real quick to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, because again, we don't want to ever get in the mindset that, you know what, look at us, you know, the pharisaical uh, mindset that, you know what, look at us, oh, we don't, we don't, you know, what's the saying, I don't uh, cuss, I don't chew, and I don't hang out with people that do, you know, I mean, when you really think about it, that's not the gospel, and Jesus was hanging out with those very people, you know, at, at, in most cases, we, we were those very people, and so in First Peter, Chapter 4, Peter writes this, beginning in verse 14. He says, If you are reviled for the name of Christ, emphasis, for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Or in other words, it's a good thing. Be happy, consider it a joy. Why? Because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So it's not you. It's actually the Spirit of God who is now living in you and working through you, constantly sanctifying you, that separation, you know, calling you out of the world, doing a work, changing your character, changing your heart, changing our mindset, you know? By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. <laughs> yeah. Stick to your own business. <laughs> yeah, paraphrasing here. Well, you see, when you stick your nose where it doesn't belong, uninvited, unwelcome, and then all of a sudden people are like, dude. Take your God and everything else and yourself, bounce. And, oh man, I'm being persecuted. You're not being reviled. No, you're just being a meddler. They didn't invite you into their conversation. You need to be discernful and look for those open doors that God presents. But Peter goes on and he says, But if anyone suffers as a Christian, as a Christ follower, and we know that that that, that, that term was given as, as a, a derogatory name by those in the world. Christ followers was a, a derogatory name because Christ was mocked, and he still is, you know. I mean, the world mocks Christ. You ask a person, why do you use Jesus Christ as, as a, you know, as a curse word, so to speak, and really call him on it? How come you don't, you know, how come you don't use any other name? And really, and most people don't really stop and think about it, when, but when they're genuine, when they really sit there and go like, why, why do I? I mean, why, why does that come out so naturally? It'll baffle them. It'll baffle them. But it's because of, because of, of, of you know, the, the enemy of Christ who has convinced the world that, you know what, to belittle the name of Jesus Christ is okay to demean and to not consider Christ holy and give that name reverence, then they go for it, right? I mean, how else do you, you know, knock people down? That's why people to this day still use names. They call people names. Why? To knock them down a peg, you know? 
And, you, and immediately people say, you're not going to stain my good name, right? With false accusations and, and, and names that do not describe me accurately. I am not going to put up with that. I'm not going to allow for it. Now, in the case of Christ, he says, well, I still died for you. I still love you. You know, Father, forgive him. But he continues and he says, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed. But in that name, let him glorify God. And I think there's a lot of Christians that won't share the gospel, they won't share their faith, because there is a certain amount of embarrassment and shame that creeps in, you know? Because, let's face it, man, we're, we're a minority. We are a minority. Uh, Christ followers have always been a minority. And until Jesus establishes his kingdom here on earth, we will always be a minority. And so, in that minority... When all of a sudden the majority are going a certain direction and yet our faith calls us and commands us to do what? Go against the flow. What's easier to do? Innately, it's easier just to go with the flow. And all of a sudden, when you start to go against the flow, you almost like, it feels strange. I mean, come on, let's face it. it, it it's, 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 it feels strange at times. But you know what the beautiful thing is? is that we are strange people. We are strange people. And that's okay. But there's a certain amount of shame that creeps in. But when you finally make that stand in love, according to the Word of God, for Christ, you won't feel and experience shame. You'll feel and experience God's glory. Because ultimately, whose word matters most in your life? Who's that a boy? matters the most in your life, or at a girl, you know? I remember as a kid, um, when we'd bring our report cards home, and this is, this is before I went wayward, you know? This is probably back in elementary school. You would bring the report cards home, and still to this day, I remember, you know, we'd get to my dad, and, you know, it would be all pumped up about our good grades, and, you know, he'd look it over, and at that time, my dad was a man of a few words, but uh, there were select words, and he'd look at it, then look at us, and he'd say, Keep it up. At a boy. You know, keep it up. <laughs> but it's like it was like cool, you know? The approval of what? My father was important. The approval of our father was important. And I didn't go to my neighbor. I didn't go to some stranger and go, hey, look at my report card, stranger. You don't even know me. I went to the person who mattered, whose opinion mattered. And it's the same for us as Christians. The opinions of the world should not matter. The only voice that matters is the voice of God. And yes, the world's going, and that's the problem. You guys hear voices. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh man. It's, it's so sad to, to know that they miss out on that still small voice. You know? But the voice of God is all that matters or should matter in our life. And he goes on to say, for it is time... For it is time for judgment to begin, where? With the household of God. This is where it begins. This is where we have to check hearts to see if we're in it, if we're in the faith, if we're trusting the Lord, if we're walking holy before a holy God. He, you know, we're holy because He's holy. And again, that just means separated. We don't live like the world. And... If it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So in other words, you know what? I, I, kind of Peter, he learned his lesson, didn't he? Remember Peter? He wanted to go out there and he wanted to intervene. It's like, no way are they going to crucify you. I'll kill who anybody, anybody who tries to do that, Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, you don't even know what you're talking about. You know? And, 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 and then ultimately when Jesus then encouraged him and exhorted him, Peter, you know, care for the sheep, feed the sheep, tend the sheep. You know, if, if you love me, Peter, then do these things. I believe that Peter learned the valuable lesson that 
Ours is to do the things that God leads us to do. And that's it. And then leave the rest to God. See, but we get too caught up sometimes. Especially, you know, in, in the rapidly declining world that we live in now as far as morals and values, rapidly. I mean, it's, it's like at a free fall, isn't it? It's literally, it's at a free fall. It's just do whatever you want, man. And, and it's okay because now there's a law for it. So it must be okay. But yet, we're so short, you know, sighted and, and, and our memories, uh, we're just, we're quick to forget our lessons that, you know what, in, in Nazi Germany, they had laws, <laughs> right? And in other countries still to this day, there are laws. And there are laws against the very, you know, fact that people just even want to live in freedom, and there's laws against freedom and people lose their lives because they want to experience religious freedoms, God-given freedoms. And clearly, obviously, those laws, they're corrupt. But ours is to focus on what God has led us to do, where He's in our calling, and we leave the rest to God, the hearts. Because if not, then we begin to focus on, on that aspect of it, the outcome, the outcome, the outcome. And we, and we begin to look through the eyes of judgment. And, and that is not for us. Yes, we're to judge fruit, but we're, we don't have the capacity to judge hearts, man. We just don't. We don't know the intricacies of people's hearts, what's going on in their lives. But going back to the text... Jesus, Jesus gives us this warning, gives this warning to the disciples. This is coming. Know this. And, and it's, it, it reminds me so much of, of when you know, the, the children of Israel first came to Samuel and they wanted a king, right? Samuel being the last judge. And they said, hey, we want a king like the other nations. And then Samuel took it to the Lord. Samuel took it very personal. And the Lord immediately said, it's not you. It's me they're rejecting. And that's a very kind and loving way to say, you're not all that, Samuel. <laughs> right? You're not all that. You know, you're just a sinner, just like the rest of them, just like all the other Israelites. There's only one perfect, and that's God. You know, the rich young ruler, when he came, how do I get, you know, how, how do I inherit, you know, uh, salvation? And Jesus said, well, go sell all your stuff, you know? First he told him, well, live, live according to the commands. Well, I, I've upheld them all. You know, I love them all. But he had a coveting problem, didn't he? He, he was coveting over his material things. He couldn't, he couldn't see himself you know, parting ways with things to go follow Christ. And so he was covetous. But there, in, in, uh, when the Israelites went to Samuel, and said, well, they want, they want a king. He says, no, it's, it's not it's not you. It's me they're rejecting. And Jesus is basically reminding us again and disciples here saying, hey, if they hate you, it's because they hated me first. This is nothing new, in other words. This also too shows that, you know, the, the, the truth in regards to the theology that God always has and always will be, that Jesus was, is, and always shall be. They hated him back then and they still hate him today and they always, always will be that, that hardened heart that rebels. We know even through the teachings of Revelation, even things are going chaotic, there's still going to be people that wave their fist at God as though that they can win a war against God. And even then, there will be those that will refuse to bend the knee. But we know ultimately, the Bible tells us what? That every knee shall bend. Every knee shall bend. And this won't be a, a God that says, oh man, you're going to bend that knee. You know, I'm going to force you. You know, bring out that whipping stick. Boom. Now let's see. Oh man, you've been struck by God. Now, okay, okay. No, it will be a natural bending of the knee when they finally come that full knowledge of realization of God Almighty. It's, it's going to be more of the falling to the knees, you know. It's like, oh, wow. But regretfully, for those who rejected Christ, they'll be eternally separated. 
And Jesus continues in verse 20, back to our text. He says, Remember the word, remember the word I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. And there's again that, you know, that repetition, my namesake, my namesake, my namesake. Because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. So, again, underline that phrase, for my name's sake. For my name's sake. And it doesn't say here, for your name's sake or because you irritate. <laughs> They'll persecute you because you irritate people. No. Persecution is strictly and solely connected to the name of Christ. Solely. Again, it's not because, oh, well, you know what, I was just trying to help them. Uninvitedly, of course, we, we omit that at times. And then, so they now they're being mean to me, so clearly this is persecution. No, you irritated them. You know, there's, there's the whole entirety of the, of the Bible, and the Bible teaches us many things. The, the most important thing, or the, mo- the greatest focus is obviously salvation, who that comes through Christ and Christ alone. But then the epistles, the epistles are primarily about how to live as a Christian while we're here waiting, you know, for our number to be called, whether it's through rapture or, you know, or the ministry's over and we go home. And so there's instructions of of Christian living. And one of them, one of those instructions is to do your best, do your best to live what? Peacefully with your neighbors. To live peacefully with your neighbors. Don't be a troublemaker. Don't stir the pot unnecessarily. Don't irritate people just because, you know, you have some knowledge of the word and you think that, oh, well, you know, I'm going to show them, you know, that, that Christ is the way and I'm going to, you know, blast them with, with biblical verses here. Again, that's not the heart of Christ. We look... We look for the example, the ultimate example is to the one who's given us these words and is Christ. He was orderly. He had great timing. He was loving. He was long-suffering. His aim was to recover those that were lost. You know? And so, yes, in the process, those that didn't want to give up their power and their positions, their hearts hardened. And false accusations began to stir. And Jesus knew their thoughts. And he knew that they were plotting against him. And yet still, he pressed on. We need to check our hearts, our motives. Is again, we could find ourselves in a position where we're just irritating people, you know, where we become a nuisance. We want to be attractive because Christ is attractive. Does that make sense? And, and the attractiveness is, is from the inside. The Bible talks a lot about, you know, yes, hey, taking care of this temple is important. It, it, there is some profit. There's teachings regarding for the ladies regarding adorning. But then ultimately the emphasis is this. Hey, don't put so much emphasis on the outward, but the most important thing is the inward. A beautiful soul. I love that term. That person was a beautiful soul or a beautiful saint. You know? And a saint isn't uh, someone who's done something for years and, and now you know they're being... Uh, commemorated and and now you know elevated no the bible calls us all saints 
Not because we're so good. No, because we're so loved. That's why. And so, you know, we're to draw. We're to be attractive. To attract. Or to be a light. Right? You know, in times of darkness, that's what people look for. is a light. A, 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 just a ray of light of hope. And then, what do they want to do? They want to latch on to that, you know? The gospel is just that. It's the good news. It's the good news. Right now, you know, because of, because of all that's going on in the world, there's a lot of emphasis on and focus on uh, poverty. There's that weapon that's being used uh, div- divisively to, to bring division within cultures and, and, and peoples, uh, through, you know, the haves and the have-nots. We hear it constantly now, right? It's like, oh, look at all these people they don't have, and then the rich have, and, and so on and so forth. And, and it's like, and, and we could easily get caught up in that. We are called as Christians. We are called as Christians to serve our fellow man, but without discrimination. We are to be the most indiscriminate people on the planet. You know? The most indiscriminate people. We serve those that are rich as well as those that are poor. Because in the eyes of God, those that don't have Christ are all poor. You know, the Beatitudes. But the point is this, is that, you know, there's this, this emphasis on poverty and so on and so forth. And you see these images and it's horrible. I mean, it's uh, we know firsthand. Obviously, as a church, we go on mission trips to Haiti, and you know uh, we see personally the poverty, the physical poverty. But you know what the awesome news is? That I don't care how poor you are materially. The great news is, is there's a mansion waiting for you. You, you, man. There's that hope of a mansion. And you'll have an awesome room in that mansion. And you're going to be clothed in, 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 in just in white, you know, in purity. And you won't experience pain and hunger pains especially anymore, you know. You'll never grow hungry ever again. You won't experience that ever again. Sorrow, suffering, tears for everyone. For everyone. But we get caught up in the ways of the world. And, and you see, the, the problem is this, is that when we come and we start sharing this stuff, what happens to hearts, especially those that are bent on trying to build the utopia? They get mad, right? They get mad. And they get out of here. You're pie in the sky, fairy tale stuff, man. This is this is a real war, man. There's a there's a war on 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 the you know on poor people, man, and they're trying to take them out. Well, think about it. I mean, okay, if you want to be logical about it, well, if the numbers of the poor keep bumping up, well, then eventually, just by sheer numbers, they'll take over the planet. <laughs> and eventually, if everyone's poor, then no one's poor, right? I mean, come on, when you think things through logically, it diffuses a lot of stuff. But man, it takes. It takes what the power out of that of that message, when you come with what with truth, when you come with truth. But like I said, we're to we're to be light, we're to to live in the fear of the Lord, live in the fear of the Lord, and and that's that's where we fail. So often as as believers, we lose sight of the reverence of God, and it happens, you guys. It happens, you know, more often, regretfully, than not. Why? Because there's this constant battle within us, our flesh versus the spirit. Can you testify to that? You know? And, and then when the flesh starts creeping in, we do fleshly things. And then we get, we lose sight of the reverence and the fear of the Lord. And the fear... You know, it's been taught numerous times. It, it's not that it's like, oh, you know what? God's going to beat me down, fear. No, it's the fear of awe. It's the fear of, of saying, God is almighty. Uh, it's like, I, I, I don't even, 
You know, it's hard to put into words to describe that, that purity of God when you experience God. But I'm going to put into words that description is just amazing. When something or someone is so amazing, you're just like, man, I wouldn't dare go against that individual. You know? And, and, and that's, that's the fear of the Lord. I wouldn't dare go against the things of God. Why? Because He's so awesome. I, I wouldn't contemplate that. But yet, in the flesh, regretfully we do that. Remember, remember back in the desert, you know, after the Lord parted the sea and took them out of bondage, out of Egypt, and now they're starting to cruise through the desert and starting to see more and more of the provision of the Lord. And finally comes a time when Moses goes up to the mountain and, and receives the commandments of the Lord, you know? And, and yet, think about that. They've already experienced the wonders of God firsthand. Firsthand. Powerful miracles. Moses leaves for a while. To them, it seemed like an eternity, you know? It seemed like an eternity. I, I think for a moment that they had, you know, the dog syndrome. The dog syndrome is, is what? You leave your dog for a moment out of one room and you jump back in, what happens? It's like they pretend that they've never seen you, right? Oh my gosh, you've been gone so long, you know? And so they start thinking like that. It's like, Moses has been gone forever. Oh, is he ever going to return? And instead of meditating on the Lord and the fear of the Lord and the wondrous works of God, no, they turn to idolatry. <laughs> they turn to the God of their own imagination. And they create, you know, the golden calf. Hey, collectively, you know? Just like, like, like the, the Proverbs that we just read. You know, what it say? That even if they hold hand in hand, it don't matter. That, that's, a, that's symbolic of what? Unity. Hey, if we stand united against God, we'll win. Remember the uh, song, We Are the People? You know, and then Hands Across America. Remember? Remember that? Yeah. I don't know how the song goes. I can't remember the time I hit. But it's like, oh, that image. It's like, you know, if we just hold hands and rock back and forth and get, you know, celebrities to sing the song, get each one assign a different chorus, and we just rock back. We'll, man, we'll, we'll conquer. And we'll come united, and everyone's just going to fall in love with each other. And What happened? <laughs> you know? It's, it's like, they don't even dare play that song anymore, you know? And, but that's, that's the mindset of the world. It's like, as long as we unite in numbers, then everything's going to be okay, or everything's going to be justified. And so they, they come together and they create this, this God in their own imagination and they have an, a, an image of this thing and then they project it and then what happens? Then this, this God that they created in their own image says, hey, it's okay to do what? Do whatever you want. Go ahead, have orgies, man. Go ahead and get drunk and dance around and well, man, come on, for tomorrow we die. You know? They're like, woohoo! And, and, and then Moses comes back and says, what's going on? And his brother Aaron's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. It's like, my gosh, I left you in charge. Right? I left you in charge. And, and he just throws the, the Ten Commandments down. It's like, oh, man. Rebukes them. And then God draws a line. It says, those, are for the, those of you that are for the Lord, you better get on this side. And then a whole generation was just destroyed, man. Rightfully, justly. You know, if, if I'm a troublemaker in my home, and I'm causing problems in my home, I need to be dealt with. Justifiably. You, you can't, you can't, you know, if you have multiple children in your home, and one of them is just constantly running amok, running amok, and bringing danger to your home, you know, putting the rest of your family at risk. We have some good friends that, that uh, you know, their son got so caught up in drugs that eventually he was owing money to drug dealers in some pretty bad areas. And, and, and uh, uh, our, our, our friends are, are from OC, you know. 
not a condition, but Orange County. You know the curtain, the Orange County curtain, right? And, and so they, all of a sudden, were getting calls from drug dealers threatening their lives, saying, hey, we, we need to get paid, and we're going to get paid one way or another. And they're terrified, you know? They had, uh, I think, five other children. And it's like, you know, what are you, you going to do? So allow some drug dealer to come and light up your whole family over one? They took drastic measures. And they called an organization that comes and literally kidnaps your kid in the middle of the night and takes your kid away, you know? And he was like close to coming to his uh, 18th birthday and they can't do that once they're an adult, right? And so literally in the middle of the night, these big burly guys came and there wasn't no knock on the door because the parents knew they were coming. They just came in and boom, just grabbed him. And he was fighting it, man. He was fighting it. But they took him away and they took him to the program for I don't know how long, but it was like, you know what, this is it, man. And, and it, it, broke, it broke our friends' hearts as parents. They were just devastated. But what were they supposed to do? They had to do something. And that was the right thing to do. Thankfully, by the grace of God, God got a hold of him. And now he's, he's so on fire for the Lord. So on fire for the Lord, you know? And actually, you guys met him. He's, he's, a, he's a young brother who came and, and uh, did uh, the um, rap ministry and did the rap worship and actually did it back when we were at Myrie. And, and it's like, you know what? He's just totally given over his life to the Lord, man. But sometimes that's what it requires. And just like we do as parents, God does the same thing. And it's just, if, if we who are corrupt at our heart can make those, those you know, just decisions, how much more who God is perfect will make them rightly? But that's the problem. Most of the world makes a God in their own image. It's called idolatry. And generally, this God allows them to do whatever they want, you know? And they'll tell you that, too. They'll say, you know what, uh, you Christians, you know, well, I believe in God, but my God, right? And then what do they start doing? They start picking certain attributes of God. My God is loving. My God is merciful. You know, my God, you know, doesn't judge. My God, and they pick, they pick out things like that. But they forget that, you know, in love, there's, again, two sides. And it's actually all included in love. Turn with me real quick to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 4, Paul writes this, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of what? Of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Alert and sober. You know, we can't afford to go into snooze mode. <laughs> you know, maybe somebody because of the time change this morning, you know, I was like, oh man, you know, thank you Lord for snooze mode, you know. But no, we can't afford to, to you start snoozing, you, you eventually slip into, you know, uh, a, a complete slumber. <laughs> and you know what happens when you oversleep? Then you're panicked. <gasps> oh, oh, oh my gosh. I'm all, you know, quick, get ready, let's go. And, and, and then you're just, your day is just constantly like, oh my gosh. You know, you never catch up. So you want to be prepared. We've been equipped. We're sons of light and of day. We're to shine brightly. Because Jesus emphasizes the fact that the reason they hate him is because he came and he exposed the sin. He exposed the sin. That's what he came to do. Why? Well, because he loves. That's why. And how did he expose the sin? Through his life. He was perfect. 
Remember when they came and tried to stumble him and trip him up with, with the woman caught in adultery? And perfectly, beautifully, he upheld the law and he showed grace and mercy. And then he turned around to the woman caught in adultery and says, you know what? Now go sin no more. You've been shown grace and mercy. Turn from that life, repent, and go sin no more. Now we know that you know, that, that wasn't a, 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 a command that, or, or um, an assumption, I should say, that she was going to be able to live a perfect life. No, but to live in a manner that keeps you out of that lifestyle, that keeps you out of that mindset, to strive for living a life of purity, of holiness, of righteousness, daily striving for that. Now continue back in, in John. You know, ultimately it's, it's not that God, you know, because for a lot of people it's like, you know what they say, well, there is no God and they create the God in their own image. You know, I, that's idolatry. And everybody has faith. Everybody has faith. Even, even the atheist has faith. They believe in nothing, you know? But even then, if you challenge them, so it's like, okay, so nothing made something. Well, no, 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 no. No, no. Is that what you believe? No, no, no. Well, there was something. Okay, so you do believe that something existed first. Well, no, no, no. It's like, oh, wait a minute, man, you know? But even the person who, who professes not to have faith has faith, but when you present them with the gospel, when you share with them in love how Jesus came to die for our sins, it's not that they can, can't find God. Because God has made himself obvious. He has made himself obvious. It's not that, that God cannot be found, but there are those who do not want to find God. Big difference. Big difference. I remember when I was living in the world, you know, even when, when I was like, when I was living in the world, man, I kind of didn't really like going to church. Because you sit there, and, and then all of a sudden, no matter what, it's like you start having thoughts about eternity. Because 10 out of 10, what? Die. And so that's a fact. Those that, are, that don't know the Lord and who don't believe in Christ and really who aren't Christ don't know anything beyond the grave. <laughs> Only Jesus does. And he said, I came from heaven, I know all about beyond the grave. And then he resurrected, and for sure he knows beyond the grave. But everybody else, man, I'm just telling you this. Anybody who does not believe in the Bible is just guessing. It's just a guess. And so, in that thought of like, well, clearly it's a fact that we die, so there must be something that happens afterwards. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. The maybe there's not wasn't so fearful, right? But maybe there is. That one grips people, you know? And maybe there is that God that I will stand before and be held accountable for my actions or accountable to for my actions. That thought made me go like... You know, and I didn't, there'd be times I'd be sitting there going, like, oh my gosh, man. <laughs> oh, man, I don't want to die. I don't want to die, man. How, how, do you, how do you overcome this thing? How do, you, how do you avoid dying? The answer is you don't. You can't. But like I said, to those, you know, there's those that just don't want to believe or find God because they know deep down inside you're going to have to give an account for the things that you did. And no matter how good you think you are, you know, you have a, a, de a deceitfully wicked heart, according to the word. And you've done some things, and you've had some thoughts, and, and, you, and you've said some things that, you know what? When you measure up to the perfect one, Jesus Christ, they're like way down here. And, and, and nothing that you can do will erase that, except the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in, in, the, gospel of, uh, in, uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, if you go back, he says, 
that you know that people don't want to come to the light because what their evil deeds will be exposed the reality of that we're sinners but because he came and spoke of sin there is no excuse nobody there's absolutely on that day there would be no one with an excuse to say, well, I didn't know, I didn't know, you know, blaspheming your name was, was a sin. I didn't know that, you know what, doing this or that was, was wrong. It's like, no, man, you don't have an excuse. God's given us even the conscience to tell us. You know? He's given us that conscience. That's why Adam and Eve in the garden, when they were naked, they're like, they felt weird. So continuing on in verse 23. He who hates me hates my father also. So simply put, you cannot profess love for God and not love Jesus Christ. Simply put, it's, we serve a triune God, one God. You know? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He continues in verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sin. And again, so not only what he said, but also to what he did, bringing confirmation beyond a shadow of doubt that he's the Son of God. No excuse. But now they have both seen and hated me and my Father as well. But they have done this in order that the world, I mean, so that the word may be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And that's in fulfillment of Psalm 35, verse 19. But note again, without a cause. Only Jesus can claim this. Only Jesus can claim that. You know, not us. Not us. We can't claim that. Even, even, even in the best day that you love Jesus, you can't claim it's without a cause because we're sinners. We're sinners. Only Jesus is perfect. You know, our, our motives at times are tainted and they're selfish. You know, why? Because again, our hearts are deceitful. You know, sometimes we could be sharing Christ because we want to show off the knowledge of the Word. You know? You might hear someone say, oh, wow, you know a lot about the Bible. And they'll say, it's like, oh, yeah, I do, huh? <laughs> You know, get all puffed up. Well, if you want, I can share more with you, you know? And it now becomes about you and the knowledge you have about the Word. Instead of, instead of their salvation, their heart, or how God is using you to minister to that individual, because it might be just a one-time thing, that's it. Or it could be, you know, uh, an ongoing thing. You know, my, my friend Rick, he's now a chaplain with, uh, with the department as well. Now, some of you may know him, Rick Rodriguez, and, and he was... Uh, asking me because he just started off and he goes he goes you know how do you know who to ride with he goes because i i have this deputy that you know what i really connected well you know and we're just it's, it's just awesome and he's been sharing the stories about how he's been able to minister to him he's an ex-marine and so rick has a heart he has a ministry actually for um wounded uh, warriors or wounded veterans and and so you know as he's sharing this i just told him rick it's real simple he goes he goes, what? I said, ask God. He'll tell you. You know? I said, but be sensitive to that because it may be for a long season or it may be for a short season. It may be just one ride along or it could be for the next couple of years, for the, for the remainder of this guy's career. I don't know. But God will let you know. But make sure that it's God because the last thing you want to do is be in the vehicle with him when you're not supposed to be. You know? This guy's trying to move you on. But like I said, our hearts could be deceitful or wicked. You know, all of a sudden we become, you know, making it about us. You know, something, something funny happened uh, to me last night. It was kind of like, just, we went to this, we got invited to this fundraiser uh, for, uh, what is it, the Corona, um, oh gosh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rescue ministry. So it's for women who are pregnant who are contemplating abortion. And so it's a place that they go to. They get a free um, ultrasound. And, and then uh, we pray that they make a decision to keep their child. And anyways, they walk them through the pregnancy, you know, and they support them. And so last night was their fundraiser. We got invited by a friend from, from work. 
And it was, it was one of their main fundraisers. And on this table, they had uh, some things that they were auctioning off. Silent auction, right? And uh, so I got up and I started looking around. And, uh, and, and they had two separate sections. And, and, and so I went to the first section and I saw all I read was a sheet. Uh, it said, new signs for the business. Um, a sofa. And then on one of them it said, refrigerator. And I honed in on refrigerator. I was like, oh, wow, they're auctioning off a refrigerator. You know, it's an auction. You know what? Man, I could be a hero because my wife has been wanting a new refrigerator, right? And you know what? I saw the highest bid at that point was only 150 bucks. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, I'll put down 200 That's scored. You know how much money I'll save? So I put down $200. And so I went back to the table and sat down. I told my wife, I said, hey, check it out, man. Guys, <laughs> I got a surprise for you. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, they're auctioning off a uh, uh, refrigerator, and I I put it down. She goes, you did what? I said, yeah. I said, $200 right now. She goes, oh, okay. So I'm I'm sitting there going, oh, yeah. You know? I'm pumped. And so eventually they announced, hey, five more minutes, and they're closing it up. Go check your bids. But for this, I had gone to the other side, too, and they had, uh, like, Derek Jeter memorabilia that they're auctioning off, uh, uh, golf, you know, for two. And I was like, that's kind of, that's kind of odd, you know? Well, golf, movies, trips, refrigerator, sofa, signs for business. I didn't register. So I went back. I went back when they said five minutes left to check my bid and make sure I was the highest one. And guess what? I was still at two hundred dollars because I already had prepared my mind. You know what? I'll go up to four hundred bucks because that's still a deal, man. You guys know how much there's new refrigerator, and they had a picture of a double door, stainless steel. Uh huh. Right? I'm going, man. I was, I was just totally coveting this thing, big time. Well, guess what? Upon further review, I started thinking this thing through. I was like, you know what? How come no one else has bid it higher than two hundred dollars? Cause that's awfully cheap for a refrigerator. You would think someone put at least two twenty-five. All of a sudden, I started reading a little closer, and it was like, no, dude, you're not getting the refrigerator. You're donating the money towards the refrigerator for their ministry. I'm like, oh, like what? I'm like what? What's going on here, man? What's going on here? And I started like, I started like, well, maybe there's a blank sheet underneath it, and I'll put that one on top, and I'll take the other one, destroy it, put the other guy's name on it, put $150, you know? And I was like, well, that can't do that. I was like, I know. I'll just go tell them, and I'll, 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 I'll just you cry out ignorance, man. I didn't know. And then I'll go back, and I'll put a bid for that painting that I saw that was worth $2,500, and it was only a $100 bill, uh, bid, you know? And I was like, no, I'll, I'll look stupid. And then you know what I thought? I'll just cross out my name. <laughs> but you know what happened? God showed me my heart. God showed me my heart. My motive. You know? Because when they started sharing the stories and the testimonies, because I went back and I told my wife, it's like, what happened? I was like, oh my gosh. I said, we're, we're donating the money to the refrigerator. It's just like, oh. You know, I, I, she didn't say it, but I heard it. You idiot. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see your lips move, but it, I heard it, man. You idiot, you know? And not so much like, oh, you're spending the money, but you're just such a fool, you know? Make a long story short, man. God just out of me big time and showed me my heart. Showed me my heart that I was in the wrong place from the very get-go. But once those stories started being poured into us regarding all the women have come in and the personal testimonies and, and an individual, as a matter of fact, Ray Comfort was the, was the uh, main speaker. His son-in-law, his son-in-law was there as a result of, of an intervention, a, a miracle intervention because his mother, at the time when they're living in Lebanon, had two abortions and he was going to be number three. And the doctor said, no. I'm not doing it. That's it. And his life was spared. And now he's involved in this phenomenal ministry and is, 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 is uh, the producer of the, of the movie, you know, 180. 
But like I said, they're sharing all this stuff, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. My motives were wrong. Only you are pure. Only you're pure, Lord. But because of him, you know, because, because Christ is the light, you know, I was spared, and, and then I gave joyfully. I was like, thank you, Lord, you know, for getting my heart right and, and doing this for the right reasons and, and not for selfish and personal gain. But he goes on, and we'll finish with this, verse 26 and 27. He says, when the helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. And you will bear witness also because you have been with me from the beginning. And that's the beauty of this. Like I said, you know, in spite of our own human nature, and our own human nature of selfishness, of, of idolatry, and, and just, you know, bad motives, he still uses us. He still uses us. Think about that. I had my personal motive. Sparkly refrigerator for the wife and save some cash. You know? Make the wife happy, save some cash. God said, fool, I'm still going to use you for my glory. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. That's, that's the amazing grace of God. And, and the power of Christ being the light, you know? Our light is Christ himself. And he always shines. He always shines, man. Christ always shines. You know, I, I look dumb. Because I told my friend, too, the one who invited me. He's like, dude, you never guess what happened. And it was like, and they were all busting up. When I shared, they were all busting up. I said, you know what? I have no shame. I mean, I said, you know, there's no shame in sharing this story. So, Feel free. Feel free to use it, you know, because this, is, this one's a doozy, you know, because I want Christ to be glorified in that, that, you know, it's like in spite of all that, boom, you know. But that's, that's the emphasis this morning is to, to be a light. God, it, you know, the Lord has equipped us for what's going to transpire in our, in our world, in our lives. When we go out there and we share purely, we share Christ. When the focus is Christ, you can expect, you can expect some difficulties. But rejoice, rejoice in that because God is glorified. Don't take it personal. Know that it's really the aim and of all the hatred is Jesus himself. And it's not people per se, it's the, the spirit of Antichrist. But know this, is that when we maintain in that persistency and even if it's just one soul, the Bible teaches us that the heavens rejoice, and then we rejoice as well. Isn't it awesome when you hear of a good friend or family member that comes truly to full conversion in Christ Jesus, and they're just testifying of his amazing love? That just brings chills you know, to my body. It's like, oh man, that just, it's like, yes, okay, let's keep up, man, let's keep it going, man. Let that light shine. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of your word, Lord God, this morning. We thank you that, Lord God, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our just sometimes, Lord God, selfish motives and, and Lord God, the way that we go about things sometimes, irritating people, trying to share you, that, Lord God, that you still use us because you are the true light. You always shine. You could take the, the most... A crazy situation where we just butcher things, even when we maybe have prepared or have, you know, the the green light from you to share with with others, Lord God, and we butcher it. But Lord God, you're not looking for eloquent speakers. You're not looking for the intellectual of your uh, the, the intellect of your of your uh, uh, people and your word, Lord God. You're just looking for vessels. And Lord, your word goes forth and it doesn't return void. You're the one who changes hearts. We thank you for that privilege, Lord God, to be used in that manner. I pray that, Lord, that we would continue to allow you to shine brightly in and through us. And that we would see family and friends 
come to know you in that personal relationship and that you would just be so pleased. Go before us now, Lord God, as we sing this final song and be with us throughout the week as we seek you with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our might. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.